We put together an updated off-season checklist for the Baltimore Ravens with training camp less than a month away. All that and more coming up next here on this episode of Locked on Ravens. You are Locked on Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into another edition of Locked On Ravens, your daily Baltimore Ravens podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Allstriker of Ravens Wire, here with you on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for being here, making Locked On Ravens a part of your day today and each and every single day are free and available on all podcasting platforms. That includes in video form on YouTube and audio form wherever you get your shows. We're five days a week here on Locked on Ravens, Monday through Friday, so you don't have to worry about not having Ravens content. For any weekday, we had to cover it here. Plus, we do bonus content as well. News analysis updates, we have the whole shebang here for you. Today's episode of Locked on Ravens is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as playoffs wind down. The sport stops boring like we want them to, but this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Another week, we are counting down the days until Baltimore Ravens training camp. Obviously, we are in a bit of a lull period. OTA's done. Mini camp done. So we're just, we're waiting. Actually, we did a little up, up upgrading, I guess, to the background with the uh, the painting in the back there. If you've been with me every day on Locked on Ravens, first of all, shout out to all the everydayers, but this was the painting that was in my old background and I just got around to putting it up. So a little, little background upgrade before we dive into training camp, but I wanted to dive a little bit more. We talked about this on Friday's show, an off season checklist, or at least the remaining off season checklist bleacher report put out their own. And I read those points off on Friday. I'll do it again here today briefly, but I wanted to put together my own. So I wanted to first start, we'll do offense in the first segment, defense in the second segment, like we do. And then at the end of that second segment, we'll put it all together into an ordered tier checklist based off of all the points that we talk about today. So I think it's going to be really exciting to talk about that and just dive into where the Ravens could end up going because we don't know if they're going to make any moves. We don't know what's going to go on, but I do think there are some areas they should at least look at. So We'll do that first and second segment. And then final part of the show, we'll talk about Lamar Jackson. And there was an article also on Bleacher Report about them potentially regretting his contract. They apparently could regret his contract. We'll talk about that. And uh, yeah, that'll be an interesting conversation. So let's talk about the checklist first here. Let's dive into it. Let's just go position by position on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, look, nothing at the quarterback position, nothing at the running back position. I think if you're talking about offense, if we were to make a point, like the checklist bubble. A wide receiver is an interesting proposition here. You know, I don't believe Baltimore will do it. I've been pretty firm on the fact that, look, if they brought in a Michael Thomas, if they brought in, you know, see, I don't know if Hunter Renfro necessarily fits exactly. Plus the injury history there is a little concerning, but then again, Michael Thomas's injury history is not necessarily <laughs> anything to write home about. So I, I, I don't think they're going to, but, I do think it would just provide a bit more stability to that room. Obviously, Baltimore is taking a very big risk here with them going with Rashad Bateman as essentially their de facto number two receiver at this point. I have seen arguments for Nelson Aguilar being the number two, but I feel like with all of the hype they've given Rashad Bateman, with all of the opportunity they're giving Rashad Bateman, I I do think it's going to be Bateman's number two job, but... If you bring in a Michael Thomas, there are a couple things or, you know, any of these receivers. And I'll, I'll actually, there aren't really a ton of great free agent receivers left out there right now. So it's, you know, the list is not super inspiring if we're being honest, but could it even be a trade for a wide receiver? I don't think they're going after Brandon Ayuk. I think that would be too expensive and they would have to give up a lot of draft capital. I just don't think they're going to give up. And we'll talk about this on a later show, just kind of sticking to wide receiver instead of going all over offense, defense, and whatnot. We'll we'll stick to that particular topic. But it just feels like, okay, Cortland Sutton will be the perfect guy, but I don't think Denver's trading him. So you probably have to look to the free agent market or get a maybe just, it's again, one of those Josh Reynolds type talents, Michael Gallup type talents. And that to me doesn't move a needle enough to take snaps away from Aguilar, to take snaps away from even Tez Walker based off all accounts we've seen now. Again, 
you're relying on a second year player in Zay Flowers, a fourth year player in Ashad Bateman, and a rookie in Tez Walker is essentially three of your top four wide receivers right now. I think to some people that's a little bit concerning, but we'll see. I, I, I do think adding a receiver would be worth it for the Ravens. I've been pretty consistent on saying that all off season. And look, when I put out a point, obviously feelings can change throughout an off season can change throughout a period of time. But for this one, I've been pretty consistent saying, look, if they roll with Rashad Bateman, it's a risk, but they believe in it enough to the point where like, <laughs> you know, it better work for him or else it, it's not going to be great. But it's just a matter of with Odell last year, right? We talk about this all the time here. It felt like we didn't, there was no defined role, right? It felt like is it Beckham, is it Bateman, is it number two, number three? We just, we never knew. So I look, it'd be great if they did. I don't think they're going to, but if I'm putting together my off season checklist, I, I'd certainly put in at least, at least dabble in the wide receiver market. But look, Baltimore has a lot of belief in their guys. I've said this a lot. I think this is the year of replacement plans, the year of the young guys. I think Baltimore truly wants to see what they have. And because of that, I don't expect a lot of acquisitions. I mean, I was even shocked at how little they did in free agency to this point, where it was literally Derrick Henry and nothing else. I mean, if you want to count re-signings, that's a different thing. Obviously, they re-signed a lot of guys, and that was good. But their only outside addition was Derrick Henry, which points to me that even though we can talk about adding receivers and we'll talk about more positions they could add at, it just, it doesn't feel likely they're going to add a lot. Maybe they'll add one person, maybe they'll add two, but I'm not expecting a ton. Now, I also think on the offensive line, I would at least dabble in the veteran market there. Obviously, Dalton Rice was a guy that would have potentially looked good. Obviously, he is now back with Minnesota. The offensive line market at this point in the offseason is very weird, you know, to the point where, it just doesn't feel, again, are there needle movers? Let's look at the Ravens' offensive line as projected right now. Ronnie Stanley, Andrew Voorhees, Tyra Linderbaum, Ben Cleveland, Roger Rosengarten. I just said, it's a year of figuring out what the young guys have. You could easily plug and play a bunch of other guys there. Obviously, they signed Josh Jones, and they have Patrick McCary still, Daniel Falele, uh, Sala. Like they, they have options, but then there's this added wrinkle that Ben Cleveland did not have a very good minicamp. And then Daniel Falele struggled a bit during the workouts as well. So how confident do people who watch the Ravens cover the Ravens, you know, how, how confident is everybody in the Ravens offensive line right now? I have the utmost confidence in Tyler Linderbaum, right? There are no questions asked. Ronnie Stanley, we know when Ronnie Stanley's healthy, he can be a surefire, all pro, pro bowl guy. But I think what people are asking for from Ronnie Stanley is to at least just be like, okay, if, if the Ravens can get 70% Ronnie Stanley, 80% Ronnie Stanley, like he doesn't have to be this, you know, amazing all pro guy. I think, you know, with the ankle injury, the complications that had just, is it realistic for him to be a hundred percent healthy? I mean, I don't, I don't think so, especially as the season goes on, but we know he can be a really good player still when he is, he is feeling good, right? Not perfect feeling if he's just feeling good. So it's a big year for Ronnie. Obviously, he chopped off that last year of his contract. It's in contract adjusting. But I honestly, out of the three I mentioned, Voorhees, Cleveland, Rosengarten, I feel the most confident in Voorhees for some reason. Then I feel the most confident in Rosengarten, and it's pretty close between those two. I, I think both of those guys will pan out in some way, shape, or form. I'm really concerned about Ben Cleveland. Personally, I'm really concerned about that right guard spot. I just, who do you put there? You want Pash McCary to be your super sub offensive lineman. I have a feeling Josh Jones might win that job. I have a feeling it's going to be Josh Jones. And I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. I, we haven't really heard a ton about Josh Jones. A lot of people are hoping that maybe he could be the next John Simpson in terms of a guy you have literally no expectations for. And then he goes out there and just balls out. And not that Simpson was like the best player for them. Obviously there were a lot of ups and there were a lot of downs. It was not a perfect year for for John Simpson in the slightest, but he he provided above what people thought he was going to do. So that's why, to me, I think it's great that the Ravens have all this young depth and young talent, but they're trying to win now, and I expect that line to gel over the course of the season. I have no problems with Voorhees. I have no problems with Rosengarten. Those two are pretty locked into me. That right guard spot, though, does concern me, and if I were the Ravens, it's either you feel confident enough in Josh Jones to compete, and that is your veteran addition. But for me, I would certainly go back out there and look at that market just to see 
who is available. Coming up, we will talk a little bit about who's available. We'll dabble both in wide receiver and offensive line, but then we'll also, of course, move on to the defensive side of things and get some points out. Plus, we will round out our checklist with a full list of importance, most to least states you plan to talk about here on the show. First, the show is brought to you by FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much and I never wanted them to stop, right? But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't really sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com slash Lockdowns. I'm making the most out of your summer. For baseball, I mean, the MLB is in full swing right now. Gunnar Henderson is in the thick of the MVP conversation. Also, Adley Rushman absolutely killing it for the Orioles right now. So you want to maybe parlay those two guys together. Or for the Ravens, if you want to open up some football money lines early, the Ravens open up as two-and-a-half-point underdogs for the Chiefs in week one on that Thursday night game. FanDuel, official sports betting partner in Major League Baseball. We're back. Our second segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Offstriker still talking with you here on this Monday. Again, really appreciate everybody for tuning in today and making Locked On Ravens a part of your day. Also, be sure to make Locked On Sports today a part of your day with Peter Bukowski, who does a great job going all over the sports world. So check him out here on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Now, let's wrap up the offensive part of the to-do list, the checklist for the Ravens, and just go over who was available if both wide receiver and offensive line, you could even just, you know, call us a bit of a needs team needs episode, which we will be doing again a little bit later. Well, probably in the next couple of weeks, maybe it'll be this week. I'm not sure. But wide receiver wise, you have guys again, like Hunter Renfro and Michael Thomas. who I mentioned at the top there, but then it's like, you know, it's Russell Gage and, you know, Richie James. <laughs> you could bring back Laquan Treadwell. That'd be something. There's just that there aren't a lot of guys, Anthony Miller, just, it feels like if you were to sign somebody, it would be Renfro, Gage, or Michael Thomas. That that would be the three. Not a lot. And then when you're talking about the offensive line in particular, again, David Bakhtiari has injury issues. Apparently he's fully healthy or, you know, he feels good and is ready to go out there. But, you know, I'm not necessarily sure about fully, fully healthy, but he said he feels good. Then you have guys like DJ Humphreys and Charles Leno, Connor Williams is apparently Connor Williams would be interesting. I would not hate if the Ravens signed Connor Williams. Now he operates as a center. I would be curious to see if he could go to guard. I would not mind Connor Williams. Now he's coming off of, I think it's an ACL injury towards ACL, I believe in Miami last year, but there are, there are more options. I would say is better for veteran offensive linemen than veteran wide receivers. But still at this point in the off season, the, the, the options are not as fruitful as uh, as the other ones. There are not as many for sure. Now, defensively, outside linebacker is one that I, I know a lot of people are talking about. By the way, offensive line trades just don't happen. I mean, I, I I would be very shocked. Maybe for like depth, which again could compete, that could happen. But I I wouldn't take an offensive line trade. Is something that would be probable. An outside linebacker trade could happen. Maybe potentially, we'll see. First of all, it depends how many outside linebackers the Ravens want to keep on their roster. I think for one, right now, let's just outline it. Personally, I feel like five outside linebackers are going to make this roster. Those five to me, Adafi Owe, Kyle Van Noy, David Ajabo, Adisa Isaac, and Tavius Robinson. Those are my five. That leaves Malik Cam already on the outside looking in. If you were to bring in, whether free agent or trade, another outside linebacker, you would probably have to keep six, and that still puts Malik Cam on the outside looking in. So I do think... Look, you're relying on, again, a big year from David Ajabo. Tavius Robinson is looking to take a jump. Adafi Owe, I think, has to have that pure breakout year. It's a lot of relying on the young guys, which I think, again, this is the year. And with that does come this. I, I will say this. There are going to be some guys this year who step up in such a big way for the Ravens in terms of their young players. Second-year guys, third-year guys, fourth-year guys. I'm sure some rookies will do it as well. But – to that same vein, it is unrealistic to think that 100% of their young talent that is coming into a place of veteran or just stepping into a big role, it's unrealistic to think that 100% of those guys will make a big impact or will it will go according to plan. That's where it worries me because while the Ravens, yes, do have depth, what happens if one of these young guys doesn't pan out and you're not necessarily prepared? Because I think they were prepared for the succession plans or are they prepared for the other part of it, which is – a young guy doesn't pan out or there's a ton of injuries and you got to move forward with that. I think Garrett DeCoste is very good at being reactive in the moment and figuring things out. 
right? It's something that was different from Ozzy Newsome. I'm not saying that Ozzy was bad at it. I, I think he was good at it, but I think Ozzy was more of like, we we are what we are. This is the roster we put together. Let's ride it out. I think Eric DaCosta is much more reactive, much more in the moment. And again, I'm not saying either or is right or wrong. I'm just saying that's kind of what the 10 years have been for both those guys. So if David Ajabo can't stay healthy, if Adafi Owe can't take that leap, if someone gets injured, and again, knock on wood, there's the knock that that doesn't happen. But it would be nice, I think, to have just another better an outside linebacker. And again, what they can honestly do here is much, it's almost like the Jamal Adams path or, you know, a couple of years ago, Des Bryant, where you kind of keep track on a guy. And then you're like, all right, if we need you, we'll call you. And that might be during the season, might not be. But who's available there? Yannick Ngakwe, I think, is the one that a lot of people are, you know, circling. I get that the fit wasn't great under Don Martin. No, I think it would be better under Zach Ward's defense. But I know that a lot of people have a sour taste in their mouth there. Tyus Bowser, actually. <laughs> How about that? Tyus Bowser coming back. You have other guys, too. Marcus Golden, uh, Anthony Barr. I mean, yeah, you have a couple other guys there as well, but I don't know. In my opinion, it just it feels like they are already set there again. This is just what what I would do personally. And then the big one for me, everybody, if you've been listening to me here on Locked On Ravens, you know exactly where I'm going with this. The Ravens need to bring in a safety. We'll talk about this literally this week. I have episodes. Unless something crazy happens, I have episodes that we're going to talk about with specific players, and we'll dive into some of who's there as well. But I just, I think it's important. And that this is not me saying, oh, the young guys can't do it. The young guys can't do it. I'm not saying that, but it would make, I think, a lot of people feel a lot better and just give them that veteran depth behind Kyle Hamilton and Marcus Williams, who are, in my opinion, the best safety duo in the NFL. But it, it just, it gives them that option. I think having the option is important. Now, there are a lot of quality safeties still in free agency. It's not like the Ravens, like for me, I think at this point in the offseason, you, you can sign depth anywhere. Right, you can sign depth pieces. It's about needle movers for me. Where can you go to find needle movers that can help your team? I think Justin Simmons is a needle mover. I think he is. I think Eddie Jackson, despite the injury history, I think he's a needle mover. I think Micah Hyde would be a really quality option for them. I don't know about his health status. I think I saw something where I, I can't remember exactly, but if he is healthy, he would be a needle mover. Even Jamal Adams in a dime backer role. In a specific role, he would be a needle mover. You have options there. The Ravens' safety depth behind Hamilton and Williams are Darius Washington, Sanusi Kane, Bo Braid. That's it. Undrafted guy, seventh round pick, and another undrafted guy who's in his third year now, if I'm not mistaken. So, look, I think Darius Washington is awesome. I think he's one of my breakout players this year if he can get a role. But I think it would help to have another safety in there, and then you can utilize. So, to me, safety, if we're doing the actual full checklist, Safety is number one. It has been number one. It will continue to be number one for me. I think wide receiver, at least checking in on that market, would be number two. Go in there. Number three, I would probably say the offensive line, just to see. Again, that right guard position does concern me a little bit. And then number four, I'd just say the edge position because I think they already have what they want there, unless they want to keep six, which in that case, it either be Malik Ham or another outside linebacker. By the way, Bleacher Reports was at a right tackle, uh, trade for Matthew Judon, and then sign an inside linebacker. I think the Judon one would be fine. I I'd like that one. Inside linebacker, they signed Chris Board. They have sent Trenton Simpson. They have Malik Harrison. I think they're, they have what they want there. And Josh Ross as well, alongside, obviously, Roquan. And then right tackle-wise, I just I think it's going to be Rosengarten versus Falele. And I would probably be more concerned about just getting some more guard depth if I were in that position. But coming up with the final part of the show, we'll talk a bit about Lamar Jackson and the discourse around his contract right now because I was not expecting this, but here we are. So be sure to stay tuned. We've got a lot to get to here on the show. First, this episode is brought to you by DK Law Group. When you need a law firm, do you want the legal runaround or would you rather have a no-nonsense approach where you get the latter with DK Law Group? DK Law Group is a Maryland-based law firm who is redefining the legal process with their modern approach. DK Law Group specializes in real estate law, estate planning, business law, and family law. They're tech savvy. They treat clients like family and they focus on keeping your legal solutions simple. DK Law Group is a woman-led firm with Diana Khan at the helm. Diana has been called an unparalleled legal expert by some. One of the things we'll quickly notice with DK Law Group is their transparent pricing. They believe in clarity and cost. 
lost and no one left in limbo. DK Law Group knows that speed is key by leveraging technology. DK Law Group streamlines the process to serve you better and faster. Contact DK Law Group today at DKLawMD.com. Locked on listeners and call today to schedule a free 30-minute consultation when you mention the tagline Empowering Legacies. We're back here, our final segment of Locked On Ravens. Kevin Ostriker still with you on this Monday edition. New week here, new Locked On Ravens episode. Of course, that's how we do it, Monday through Friday. Plus, we do some bonus episodes on the weekend as well. We go live after every single Ravens game and after every single piece of Ravens news, especially the big news. And we're adding a new thing this season where we will have bonus episodes every game day throughout the season. So obviously, I mean, that'll be regardless on weeknight games like Thursday and whatnot, but Monday as well. But I mean, those Sunday game days, those are going to be a new addition to the show. So be sure to subscribe, follow along, video form, audio form. It's the same show. Just hit 7,000 subscribers and we're on the way to eight. So if you want to be a part of that journey, whether you're an everyday or new to the channel or somewhere in the middle, thank you for tuning in and for your support on the show. Now, there's been a lot of conversation about Lamar Jackson. And <laughs> I, I think that's not a hot take. but There was some interesting conversation, this again, on Bleacher Report. It was an article about the contracts that teams might come to regret. And for the Ravens, they actually had two guys on this list. It was Lamar Jackson and Justin Matabike. But when pulling from this article, I I focused on Lamar. And here is essentially a summarization of what was said in the article. Actually, I'll I'll pull the article. Let's, Let's read it from the article. Um, with Lamar Jackson, who, by the way, is nowhere near the highest paid quarterback anymore, despite him getting his contract literally, you know, over a year ago now, as a four, for those who don't remember the actual terms, it's five years, 260 million with 185 guaranteed, which again was last year. Now, why they might regret it. The article says, while Jackson immediately put together an MVP campaign for the Ravens, he again failed to get them to a Super Bowl. Now he'll become more expensive and the rest of the roster will decline as a result. What's more, we're talking about a somewhat fragile, often exposed quarterback who has failed to complete two of his last three seasons. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Where I start with this one, I think, look, what, what did the Ravens have a choice to do? First of all, like they had to give him the contract. I mean, he's Lamar Jackson. What are you going to do? Let him walk? Trading him would have been a mistake. They came to an agreement. And the discourse around this is, look, we just saw literally like two weeks ago. No, it was last, literally last week, right? It was literally about a week and a day ago. Trevor Lawrence, I mentioned Lamar, was five for 260. Look, Trevor Lawrence just got five for 275. He got 200 million guaranteed. I mentioned Lamar Jackson. He only got 185. Now, Trevor Lawrence is on this list, so, you know, but you know who's not on this list? Who's getting paid higher than Lamar? Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow's not on this list. You know who else is not on this list? Josh Allen. Josh Allen is not on this list. Now, I know that Allen's deal was signed, you know, far before, you know, signed before Lamar, signed before Burrow, but there is there is this discourse about Lamar, and we barely hear any of it for Josh Allen and Joe Burrow. Now, even for Allen, like they talk about his interceptions sometimes and like, you know, like his turnovers and they they do say that's a big deal. But I just feel like with Lamar, the conversation is always different where, yes, there are a lot of big money quarterbacks who made this article. Obviously, you know, Daniel Jones is in that vein and Jalen Hurts is here as well. So there are, I mean, Herbert's in this. Con- so there are guys like all these players. Why wouldn't you put Joe Burrow in this conversation either. And I'm not, I'm not trying to just focus on, oh, Burrow's not here, Burrow's not here. That's that's not the point. But, like, for all these quarterbacks, like, yes, Daniel Jones, obviously that was a bad deal for the Giants. I mean, they kind of had to do it in a sense, but that was a bad deal. But the rest of these contracts, it's just the way the market works, right? Hurt signed before Lamar, which means Lamar got more money. Lamar signed before Burrow and Herbert, which means those guys got more money. Those guys signed before Trevor Lawrence, which means Trevor Lawrence got more money. The salary cap is going up. So in terms of the roster, like getting worse, yeah, you can't go out there and just go on a spending spree when you have a quarterback on that type of deal, for sure. But, you know, the salary cap goes up, which means you are you get that deal. And why do the deals get higher? Because the salary cap goes up. That's why it happens. I mean, there are other factors to it as well. But with Lamar, he is locked into that 260. So when that cap goes up, 
and maybe it'll go up 5 million, maybe it'll go up 10, went up 20 plus last year. Whatever it goes up, that makes it a little easier. Plus, you also have other contracts come off the books, you're re-signing guys, you're bringing in rookies. Like there's there's a bunch of conversation. Yeah, again, you can't spend all this money with a quarterback on a big deal. They should have done that during his rookie season. They did on defense. They didn't do it necessarily a ton on the offensive side of the ball outside of the offensive line with a couple of guys. But I don't know. It just feels like with the Moore's contract, it's becoming a bargain in a sense because you even see Jared Goff get paid. And I don't believe Jared Goff is on this list. Maybe I missed it. Aaron Rodgers is on this list. So there are a bunch of quarterbacks, but no Joe Burrow and no Jared Goff. Kirk Cousins is on this list too. I mean, again, it's like Jared Goff's getting paid more than Lamar. Who would you rather have, Jared Goff or Lamar? Lamar. Trevor Lawrence getting paid more. Who would you rather have? I'd rather have Lamar. Herbert, I'd rather have Lamar. Rogers, I'd rather have Lamar. Now, I also think that, you know, him failing to finish two of the last three seasons, well, what did he do last year? He was healthy. He stayed healthy. Right? If Lamar, if Lamar can stay healthy this year, I don't want to hear about his injuries anymore. I, I don't want to do it. Because if he gets – look, if he gets injured next year, which I don't – you know, hopefully will not happen. Knock on wood. There's going to be so much discourse about it. I don't even want to think about it right now, but if he stays healthy for two straight seasons, it's like, okay, yeah, he was injured before, but you know, it's different past is past. And we're dwelling on, Oh, well, guess what? I get that Joe Burrow made a super bowl. You know, I get that these guys, the playoff success for Lamar has it been great. No, he hasn't played well enough in the playoffs for the most part. I get that. But it just feels like putting him in this conversation and saying, oh, yeah, well, golf's contract is not. And again, I'm not putting too much stock in the list. Like, it's honestly whatever. But there's just a ton of discourse around Lamar right now. And we're at that point in the offseason. <laughs> I mean, we're doing checklists and all that, which, again, is it's, it's, it's fine to do that. It's fine to speculate. It's fine to, you know, put out opinions and all that. Like, I'm not saying that's not a thing and not allowed. Of course it is. But, of course, when opinions get put out, we will talk about them. So that, that's all, you know, not, not something that you got to worry about, but just wanted to, I think it's an interesting conversation because the deal obviously is huge. The Ravens should have given it to him. And now we're at this point where, yeah, quarterbacks are getting paid more than that, but we're still talking about Lamar Jackson's contract like he's bad. And I just don't get that because we are now at the point where it's what six to eight quarterbacks who have gotten paid more than Lamar at this point. So I don't know. Just feels like that's what the quarterback market is. Guys getting paid. And guys getting guys one up on the other guy. And Lamar's now so far down on that totem pole. It's where it's like, yeah, that, you know, getting 290, 295, 300 million. Lamar's going to be at 260. And that'll be feeling nice down the line. So that's all that is. That's all I have for you here today on Lockdown Ravens. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Again, be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel on YouTube, follow along in, in audio form as well. Coming up tomorrow, of course, we'll be right back here with more Ravens content. So be sure to stay tuned. We'll see you right back here tomorrow on Lockdown Ravens.